you know, as a Boise State alum, I am beyond honored and blessed to bring on the athletic director of the university, Jeremiah Dickey, to the show. When Jeremiah first took the, the helm at Boise State as the athletic director, I, along with many others that I know, were, I mean, apprehensive is probably the best word to put it, because, see, we we were excited and we wanted, we were hopeful that this new athletic director would be able to um, really change the direction of the ship, so to speak, and navigate the tough waters during the COVID era and, and all the other tough waters that we were about to experience with the transfer portals and NIL and all the things that come with it. But we were apprehensive. We didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And Jeremiah Dickey has taken the bull by the horns quite literally. He's built an amazing staff. He has been extremely uh, involved with the community. He has the fans rallying behind him and his programs are seeing the fruits of his labor and the, the labor of his staff members and everyone else that's behind the scenes doing the work. And today we get to learn what it's like to be an athletic director at a division one university. He's going to talk to us about the, the struggles and, and, and the wins that he's experienced and the things that they go through for the non-revenue generating sports, the, the way that they utilize football to try to help trickle down to the other sports the leadership qualities that he, that he has and, and what uh, his faith means to him and what his, his purpose is here. It's a very, very intriguing discussion. And I would encourage you guys to take notes. I'm just so grateful for his uh, willingness to join the show. And if you guys would do me a favor, hit that follow button. If you're listening to the podcast on Apple podcast or Spotify, it hit the subscribe button, right? Or whatever podcast platform that you're on. But if you're listening to this on YouTube, hit the follow button so we can build the YouTube platform as well. I hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Game Time Guru. So, what time is it? Game Time Boo! This is the Game Time Guru podcast, where I interview sports figures from all over the world to help deliver a panoramic view on sports. So whether you're a former athlete, one of the crazies, or simply a casual sports fan, this is the perfect show for you, as we peel back the curtains and learn from our guests every single week. I'm your host, Shane Larson, and I'm helping you see sports through a different lens. What's up, everyone? Welcome out to another episode of the Game Time Guru Podcast. And I apologize for anybody who's noticing my voice a little raspy. Uh, I was coaching as our first club basketball tournament this this last weekend. So at the time of this recording, <clears throat> I don't think I was well conditioned for uh, for the coaching world yet. Um, that happens to me every football season too. First game of the football season, if I'm at a game, uh, I end up with no voice afterwards because you have to condition yourself as a fan. So that's where I'm at right now. But uh, beyond ecstatic for this opportunity to bring on our guest today. Um, I had the opportunity, as you guys heard in the introduction, I had an opportunity to to listen to um, Jeremiah Dickey as a guest speaker at the Athletic Leadership Conference that Boise State put on in the summer of 2023. And I was there uh, in attendance, and uh, it was really, really cool for me to hear. I've always been a fan of, of Jeremiah Dickey as the athletic director at Boise State, and I've been a fan of his. I know a lot of the fans are fan, fans of his, and but then hearing you speak was just amazing. So I'm just beyond ecstatic to be able to interview you and get a little bit more insight as to what it's like to be an athletic director at uh, Division One University. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, joining us is Jeremiah Dickey, athletic director of Boise State University. Thank you for joining the show, sir. Hey, thanks for having me on. I, I've been looking forward to this. Oh man, it's it's uh, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here. So, here's the thing: um, I, I told some of my coworkers who are all we're all Boise State alum and we all chat about you know the, the the sports programs and stuff we're all big fans and whatnot and they were so stoked and they everyone that i i spoke with this is no less than 10 people at work wanted me to make sure that you knew that from a fan's perspective and from an alumni perspective how much they love you for just who you are is like your your presence on social media who you are as a human being a uh, nice christian man who understands his beliefs and he sticks to his morals and ethics and just someone who's done well for the program. So I'm sta I'm stating that first so I don't forget it because everybody said that, all right? So, man, and I agree 100% with every one of them. You know, Jeremiah, when you came to, to Boise State, I one of the biggest questions I have for you is like the differences for like an athletic director from Boise State University compared to maybe a major university, maybe a power five or something. Was the, like we're talking budgets, 
for the athletics, the community itself. Yeah. Um, I just want to compare that to maybe that of a power five and some of the hurdles you might have to go through with being an athletic director here as compared to maybe a, a major university. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of us are dealing with similar challenges. You know, I don't care whether you're at Baylor in my case and, and or Boise state, we all need more, right? There, there's a reason why realignment and, you know, all the, all the chaos of our industry is, is happening. And, and I think we all, you know, I don't know if there's an AD out there who says, Oh no, we have enough. Um, and so that's similar. And, and look, we're set up very similar, if not the same to, to many of the, the power four now, um, you know, where we're probably the differences lie, you know, our expectations here compared to some of the power fours are also the same. Um, it's the resources in general that's that are challenging. And, and that's not just the dollars, that's staffing, you know, that's that's your facilities and ultimately which leads to more opportunities to monetize. Um, that's how you serve your student athletes, you know, uh, coming into a place like uh, Boise State where we did not have a full time nutritionist. You know, um, that's something that the power four were well ahead of the curve, not not all of them, but many of them. And and so in general, um, you know, I, I felt like I was well positioned for a place like this. I wanted to be somewhere where there were high expectations, similar to, say, the power four, where you have national championship aspirations, you know, uh, in, in your sport programs. And um, and I think my job as an athletic director is is, you know, uh, very similar to to, to what those, uh, you know, men and women are navigating in, in those conferences, um, you know, and, and I think that's the opportunity for us, you know, because, and you've heard me say this a lot, unrealistic expectations produce epic results. You know, uh, our expectations here don't necessarily align with the, the necessary support and that was low hanging fruit. And that's why we've dedicated so much time, energy and effort to, you know, uh, monetizing our operations, professionalizing our operations you know, pushing six game, six sellouts and, and selling out extra mile. And, you know, because every dollar matters and every dollar that we bring in, we are putting back into the department and into serving our staff, student athletes and supporters. Man, that is, that's the stuff that I knew was going to be gold here. Because when I heard you speak at the athletic leadership conference, I was like, dude, this guy is so well-spoken and these little <laughs> tidbits of information is what like everybody needs to hear, especially those who are on my platform who have been listening for the last seven years. They want to hear that stuff. That's insightful. Yeah. It gives us a new perspective on things and it gives us a little bit, I would say almost like empathy for those who like just don't fully understand. Like everyone's going through it. We get a little perspective. Don't it's grass isn't always greener over here. Everyone's kind of going through similar things. Nice. Um, it's just, sometimes there's different hurdles. Now, you were talking about like every dollar counts. One of the questions I, I wanted to ask you, Jeremiah, was in regards to coaching, you know, one of the problems as I've been in this industry from the media perspective, I've, I've been running the show for seven and a half years, talking to different athletes and everyone from all over the globe, coaches and everyone. You're the first athletic director that I've actually had on the show, which is really cool. But one of the problems we see at, at schools like Boise State is sure the head coach can get a pretty high paying job, but it's hard to keep assistant coaches. And the thing that we've always discussed was the assistant coaches are actually like, let's just say for football, for example, an assistant coach is really what the skill position players are going for. Cause they're not going to be yeah. hanging with the head coach all day long. They're with their offensive coordinator or their quarterbacks coach and whatnot. And it's just the nature of the game. Some schools can afford to pay higher dollars for assistant coaches than mm -hmm. us. And so there seems to be a little bit more of a turnover for the assistants, so to speak. And I'm just curious, like, um, yeah, I just want the athletic director's perspective on this and how you go about navigating that when we're talking about taking care of the student athletes, like you said, but like, how do we make sure, you know, we keep them bought in, even though there is a potential for turnover on the assistant coach perspective? Yeah. You know, money obviously is a, a major driver in our industry, whether it should or shouldn't, that's a whole other conversation. Um, you have to be so locked in on your why, you know, uh, and this for me specifically, and, and obviously I'm not an assistant coach and, and more probably defined as a head coach. Um, money's never been a driver. You know, you want to be somewhere where you can win championships. You can compete at the highest level that your family, because that is a priority for many of our people here, those that have families with them, you know, a significant other, et cetera. But, you know, this community is amazing. So when we look at, at hiring, you know, you can't, you control what you can you know, I'm not necessarily concerned about coaches, any coach leaving um, or staff. And I don't say that in a negative way. I want what they want. 
I, I don't want people here who I'm having to buy loyalty for. You know, that that does not produce uh, or, or allow us to meet the expectations of serving everyone that we're responsible for. Um, you want people to be here for the right reasons. And there are many cases that assistant coaches, I have conversations with, our coaches have conversations with, that we're telling them, hey, this is a good opportunity for you. You know, you need to look at that, whether it's to get closer to home, whether it's to elevate them so they can have a chance to become a head coach in, in his or her sport. You know, that becomes part of the conversation. And that ties into people are our greatest asset. You know, now, ultimately, you know, we do need to pay more. That goes back to how we're monetizing. And you've seen since I've been here, I don't think there's an assistant coach or head coach who has not gotten more. Um, that's just the reality of the business. That's also the reality of living in this unbelievable community that a lot of people moved in during COVID and the cost of living skyrocketed. It used to be a competitive advantage for us. Now it's becoming more challenging. You know, at the end of the day, that puts pressure on, on the system for us to find solutions to what that looks, looks like, whether it's partnering with people within the community to create housing opportunities or finding creative ways, you know, additional ancillary benefits of, you know, whatever it is, courtesy cars or country club memberships, or, you know, you're constantly trying to improve your situation. And, you know, you look at what we're paying our office and defensive coordinator. You can be an office and defensive coordinator at the power four level. And on average, they're probably making what we're paying our head football coach. You know, the, the numbers are, 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 it's, it's astronomical. Like you, you can't, I can't compete with that. And so you have to find other ways. And, you know, for me, I'm a relational person and, and, you know, that's important to me and, and I'm going to have those conversations and we're going to talk through that. And we're going to, we realize that for some of these individuals, we're limited on the time that they, that we have them. And what can we do in the meantime? Because you're also looking at this boomerang effect at some point, someone will come back that whether that's for a head coach job or a position coach wanting to be an offensive or defensive coordinator and they enjoyed their experience. So it's not in our interest to, to view it from a negative standpoint. You know, I try to see positive in everything that we do. And there's a reality to this that every cycle, because of the, the level we're, we're operating at, um, you know, in the industry, every cycle we are fighting to hold on to our people and you're trying to beat other teams to the punch. Um, but we understand that, that what I can offer for an assistant, someone else is going to be able to double, if not triple it. And, you know, and money is a, a driving force and that's not a bad thing. I, I fully understand that. And so, um, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but like, you know, when that is, that becomes a topic, you know, with our, with our donor base and, and those supporters and, and the different opportunities we're looking at, like the North end zone facility or, you know, it's yes, it's about the student athletes. It's also about our staff. And it's not just our assistant coaches. It's my senior associate ADs. It's our associate ADs. You know, they we are doing an amazing job. And I should say they are doing an amazing job. They are being recognized. And that's a good thing. If someone's coming after your people, it means you're doing well. And I would rather have that than the opposite. You know, when you're having to have an uncomfortable conversation of this isn't working. And so I want good people. I want them to have those opportunities. I want to be able to compete and, and fight for them. And, and we've been able to do that. Even getting a guy like Stacey Collins to come from Penn State, you know, back to, you know, what you say, which he was here before. Um, it was because of the experience. It was because of the people. It was because of someone like Spencer, who he, he appreciates and respects. Um, that means a lot. We've been able to hold on to our basketball staff. Those guys could go off and not only become head coaches, they could get higher uh, level uh, assistant positions in the industry, but they've chosen to say because of the respect and appreciation for, for Leon and the experience here. And, you know, and, and many of them call our donors friends, you know, and, and so that connectivity, you know, uh, which I think is maybe a little different from, from your previous question of the, the power four versus where we're currently at, you know, we are so connected to people uh, and have to be, and, and yeah, does that add more work and, you know, but that's that's just who we are. And and that's something as long as I'm the leader here is going to continue to be important. And we're going to win some, we're going to lose some. Um, but I always, you know, look at what's next. I can't sit back and, and cry over spilt milk. It's it is what it is. And as soon as someone tells us it's thank you, we love you. If I could ever help you. But what's next? And we're off to the next person and we're going to go out and find the next best thing. 
And sometimes, and in many cases, we get better. And if we can continue that cycle, um, it's going to pay dividends for us down the road. No, I absolutely love that. One of the things that I just it just keeps ringing here, and what I've noticed just from the outside looking in before this is your positive attitude. Um, it's 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 a positive attitude as a leader, which is essential to keep a positive attitude and move forward. I mean, there's so many things you mentioned. This is what's crazy is like when we were in the athletic leadership conference, you talked about the transfer portal and like the hiccups that that kind of caused. And you had to like work through that. Cause that that's a, a relatively new thing in, in the college athletics landscape for everybody. And so as an athletic director, you have to deal with that. Um, and then you're also dealing now with name image and likeness being a, a motivating factor. And like you said, for the coaches, you know, money is a driving factor, but now for the players that can also be that. And, and uh, there's just so much that shifts the entire landscape that shifts recruiting. It shifts everything. Is there anything that you could give as far as advice that you've had from coming in here when you did, and then dealing now dealing with the transfer portal and name image and likeness on top of that, from the athletic, uh, sorry, the athletes perspective that you could give advice for like any other ADs that might be struggling with that same thing and being like, okay, well, how did you take your positive attitude and, and find a positive out of all of this so that you could make it work? Yeah, I, which I've said publicly before, um, it's never as bad as it seems, never as good as it seems. You know, my job is to stay as neutral as possible and, and I have to be what others need me to be. And sometimes that means I have to believe more than others. And, you know, it doesn't mean it always works out. You know, I'm not perfect. And, and you know, and I think that's just the reality of our industry right now. You know, uh, um, there are good days, there are bad days, you know, but how we approach it and our attitude is a big part of that is going to determine how you come out of it, you know, and, and if I sit here and, and drop my head and, and look, there, there are moments, you know, if I'm being real, like I'm human, you know, there are moments that I'm in this office and it's late, you know, and, and, you know, it's emotional and, and you're upset about something or, you know, and, and, the, but my job is for everyone to, to get what they need out of me as much as they possibly can. And, and a lot of that happens behind closed doors for me. You know, what I, what I am to my team, what I am to our student athletes, hopefully, and, and our staff and, and Bronco Nation in general is that positive reinforcement that we are going to be okay. And, and I think for ADs coming up in the industry, this job was hard enough on a good day. You know, now na navigating portals and everything else, it's just something else. You know, it's it's what probably a, on a different level, and I'm not saying it's apples to apples, but you know, now we're trying to charter more sports, and and that there's increased costs, and there's nutritionists, and there's game times, and games changing from Saturday to Thursday and Friday, and zero week games, and you know that like there's always change. It, it change is inevitable, you know, and and the only constant is how we approach it. And you know, if I sit back here and and complain or any AD complains about it, you know, nothing good comes from it. Now, are we in a challenging position right now? Is it uncomfortable? Absolutely. It's chaos. You know, uh, just getting back from the final four. I mean, that was one of the number one topics that I heard from every AD coach, et cetera, that I connected with um, was everyone's tired. And, you know, and, and so we, it's forcing us to get creative and, and innovative, whatever you want to call it, and how we're going to approach these things. And, that's us defining our own expectations and, and looking at it as an opportunity to say, all right, we know it's changing. It's already happened. How do we position ourselves now to put our best foot forward? And, and the only way to do that is to try. And there is no guarantee in anything that we propose. And, and that's how I'm approaching it. And, and I think our team has really adapted to that and, and embraced it in many ways and our coaches specifically. And that's why, I think we haven't been hit with by the transfer portal as much, you know, and it doesn't mean we won't. Um, that's why we've been able to recruit at a high level. That's why we continue to win at a high level. Um, is there always more to be done? Yes. But, you know, I, I think it starts with that attitude. And, and if you already approach it from a, a, a you know, a, a negative mentality, you've lost, you know, uh, I can't guarantee you that we're going to win because I'm positive you know, but that gives me more of a chance than, than if I approached it and throw my hands up and say, you know, I have no control over this. And, uh, you know, and maybe it's the perception of control that I live with, you know, and, and, um, but you know, I, I, that's, it's gotten me here, you know, and, and I've been this way my whole career and, and, you know, uh, my goal and job is to be my authentic self. And, and I think that's positioned us well for, 
present day and future. I love that, man. I mean, it's it's so cool to see your leadership style. It's it's contagious, and I and I hope that people take away from this interview something like just the attitude of, uh, attitude behind it. It's easy to say it; it's one, another thing to actually do it. And you have consistently mm-hmm. showed that. Now, you know, Jeremiah, I was talking to a guy named Pete Steinberg on my show just a week ago. I was interviewing him, and he was a uh, he was the world the the women's World Cup rugby coach uh, for the World Cup and the Olympics, and now he's huh? a corporate leader. He's a great dude. And he wrote a book called Leadership Shock. And one of the things he talked about, the, the difference between high-level athletes and high-level leadership roles in any corporation or organization was that high-level athletes actually, they, they have very similar traits. They have a, they want to grow. They want to continue to, to get better. They want to keep their, their team accountable, but they want to be a good teammate and leader and all this stuff. But the, the athletes have this, they have the ability to recover and rest from when they put in all this hard work and they're doing all that but then they get to rest and recover so that they can continue to compete at a high level. And he was mentioning how like in corporate leadership or any organization where you're a leader in a top position like yourself, oftentimes the the rest isn't a focal point and it causes struggles. And you just mentioned athletic directors talking about being you know tired and everyone's, it's exhausting. There's chaos all the time. And from a leadership perspective, this is more of a leadership question for you. I would like to get your advice from, from your perspective. How do you find rest and how do you find a way to recover so that you can continuously put in that 100% effort that you're doing? Well, I'm never a finished product. And that's something, quite honestly, I struggle heavily with. Um, you know, I'm not just the athletic director. I'm a, a husband, a, a father. You know, a, a, my faith supports me. I'm a Christian. And, and you know, you last week, for example, you know, I'm traveling with gymnastics and I'm going final four, I'm back this week and and everything's stacked. And then I'm out of town next week and you're just constantly going. And, you know, I was watching something and I can't remember who was saying it. Um, at various points in time, you have to, to live an unbalanced life. And that doesn't mean 100% of the time, but I'm in a time right now where I'm unbalanced. And, you know, you do your best to find those moments. And for me, it's connecting with my family, you know, so whether it's taking my kids on a, you know, like this year, I, I told each kid, I have three uh, kids, Emerson, uh, Elijah and Easton. And I told, and the, the youngest one is five. So I said, look, I'm going to take you to a basketball game. That's much easier, two hours, you know, versus football, but on the road. And I, I took each of them on the road with me and, um, I can't tell you how meaningful that was for me, um, you know, as opposed to sitting in a hotel, you know, uh, by myself and to have one of my kids with me and to, see, you know, for donors and others to see my staff, to see me, you know, as human, um, it was really important. And those are moments that I try to take advantage of and, and taking my family to Dayton, you know, uh, I try to take my wife to, to different meetings and, you know, for them, maybe it's a vacation um, for me, maybe, you know, not as much. But that does bring me some peace and and it bridges the gap, you know, from one week to the next. And, you know, I need to do a better job of finding time for myself, you know, but, you know, there's there's a lot of guilt that comes with that, you know, uh, husband guilt, dad guilt, you know, that, uh, you know, my my personality is not is not limited to just this office where my goal is to be what everyone needs me to be. My goal at home is also for them, you know, for me to be what they need me to be. And I my biggest fear is, you know, five, 10 years from now when, you know, right now my kids love me and want to be around me, you know, they'll always love me, I hope, but you know, they may not want to be around me 10 years from now, um, is to try to take advantage of those moments. And I get so much peace and and I'm so grateful for those moments that, you know, I don't, I don't need to go golf by myself. I, I don't, you know, go on vacation alone. I, I, you know, there's, you try to take advantage of certain times. Uh, you know, one of the things I've started to do, which is, you know, uh, um, it seems so insignificant and it's small, but when I go, you know, when I drive in from home to the office, um, in the morning specifically, I have my coffee and I don't have the radio on and I try not to make calls and I just sit in silence. And a lot of times I pray and, you know, and it's my time to, you know, before the, the day gets chaotic, um is to just sit there in my own thoughts and to try to find that inner peace that you know allows me to get through some of the you know the challenging times of the day and you know i you you find those moments and 
needs. And there's cycles in our industry and right now the portal is creating more chaos where, you know, the portal is about to open again. And so whatever we got through initially, we're having to do it again. And, you know, and it's holding on to your players and, and that's a big part of our culture and, you know, and the consistency and the team aspect, um, you know, but over the course of a week, there are moments and it may just be for 20 minutes before my next meeting, you know, that I'll sit in here and, and I'll maybe read a leadership book or, or I'll call my mom or, or dad or, you know, and, and just find those times that, that I can be human and um, not perfect. And I don't do it nearly enough, but you know, it's needed because this, it does weigh on you. Um, and, and that's the, the piece that I probably am still getting used to as an AD when you're number two, no one cares, you know, about you, like no one wants to talk to you or do podcasts or, you know, like they don't care what your thoughts are, you know, now, now because of the role and that's just part of it. And my wife reminds me, I chose this. No one's making me do this. And so it, it, she brings good perspective and other people in my life pour into me and friends that I've created in this community that. We'll say, hey, let's just go have lunch. And, and I'm so grateful for those moments because my friends don't ask me about, you know, who's starting at quarterback or who's, you know, uh, they, they don't want any. They just want to see me and they want to, to hear what's going on in my life. And um, and that means a lot to me. And I, I think that's a big part of this. That's so awesome, man. I, I think that's super insightful. I would encourage anyone who's listening to this right now to rewind that and maybe take some notes if you didn't, because I think we all, to some degree, can probably do better. At that, we're in a, in a world with a lot of noise, just various industries, right? You're in the athletic world, but like there's different industries where it's so much chaos, so much noise, social media is out there. There's so much noise. Yeah. But like you just saying, like driving into work, if it's 10 minutes of just being in silence, like some people are scared to be in silence these days with their mm -hmm. thoughts. That's just a thing. We're not used to doing that, but that can be really huge. And for you as a Christian and like praying and, and quote unquote, putting on the armor of God before you get into work and before you go into the quote unquote battle, you know, like it's just kind of those yeah. cool concepts i think that's really awesome man like uh and i commend you for that and we're all we're all getting better and i think that's cool yeah. that's what that's the beauty of being a human being right there's only right. one perfect person on this earth i believe and we're not him so right. <laughs> we're all trying right. to be more like him but we're not we're not him so um you know jeremiah if you look at your tenure so far at boise state specifically what would you say is like your biggest win um whether that's something that happened in like an athletic accomplishment from one of the programs if it was something that you and your staff accomplished what would be your biggest win as an athletic director so far um first and foremost i would say my staff in general uh you know coming here out of covid and and we were, technically we were still in covid and you know accepting this job sight unseen and and getting to the office and half the office being on furlough and um you know it was really challenging and and you get to know people and you know, you create this vision and direction and, and you provide these seats on the bus, so to speak, and, and everyone had a seat. And ultimately over the course of time, people realize this isn't what they want. And, and that's okay. My goal was to find Broncos. I want to find Broncos, people that want to be here. And, and that's important to me. And, you know, in three years um, to see the transition we've had and the experience that I've been able to bring in and how this team has come together. And it, and it finally dawned on me probably at the end of last semester going through that football change was difficult, but I can't tell you how many uh, members of my team came in and, and checked on me or, or, you know, uh, um, just put their head down and, and went to work and, and helped. And when I was navigating a search and, you know, it's, I, I'm not one of those ADs that just delegates everything and, you know, there's responsibilities, but them coming to me and saying, Hey, let me take that from you and let me help with this. And, um, that, that meant so much to me and, and people, like I said earlier, people are greatest asset and to see how far we've come in three years and completely transformed this department and got people to buy in and, and not necessarily that they all had to be like me. Um, you know, the diverse the diversity of thought and experiences and, you know, levels of ownership, um, that's where, you know, when. Quite honestly, I probably, I not probably, I get way too much credit. You know, uh, our team is is outstanding, and and I'm so grateful for them. And that's what what drives the the you know the change that maybe Bronco Nation is seeing, and and the in, in 
you know, investments into the staff, student athletes and supporters. And so I would say the staff and how, how the culture of the department has grown in that time. And that means the world to me. Uh, that's more important than, than the wins and losses in many ways, because, you know, you can't control that in, in, in a lot of ways, but the staff and how we show up and, and that's, that's, uh, that's important. The other piece is, you know, just Bronco Nation and the resources. You know, when when I'm told I can't do something, um, that fires me up. And my first six months, I, I met with a lot of donors, a lot of sponsors, a lot of members of our community, a lot our whole department. I met with every single staff member, and I just questioned things. You know, why have we done it this way? Why have we done it that way? You know, uh, what about this facility? We did facility walkers and and you know and and very quickly this this vision you know this path forward was laid out for me and and that tied into our what's next initiative and our playbook for success in terms of our facility assessments and and a lot of the progress that we made but i couldn't do all that without bronco nation embracing it and you know when you look at what we've been able to fundraise you know and people telling me we can't you know get to ten thousand donors um we're at 7,000 now. When I got here, we were at 3,500. And, and that's a testament to our BA team. That's a testament to everyone who stepped up. And, you know, it, you got to spend money to make money. And, and, and yes, I know that's probably controversial in college athletics because that's not necessarily the narrative that's been out there, but that is the reality. And whether people like it or not, you have to invest. And, and in our case, there were a lot of deferred maintenance things that that we needed to go out and do lights at facilities video boards changing out new turf in an indoor that and a lot of this stuff should have been done 10 20 years ago and and so you chop wood you you know you we identified every need and we went to work and and just cuz i identify it and just because we put it out there doesn't mean that it's going to happen it takes a team and you and i needed bronco nation to step up and so whether it's the blue collar club given $50, like that matters, every dollar matters. Or one of these many donors who've given us seven figure donations, um, that matters. And it's allowed us to bridge that gap much quicker. And, and when you take that along with the brand that I inherited and this blue turf and the power of the blue and this blue collar mentality, um, you can do amazing things. And, and that's what we've done. And, and so a lot of credit and something I'm very proud of is how Bronco Nation has truly embraced that. And, you know, and like I said, it's not perfect and, and you can always, you always need more, but we have made so much progress that we're going to get to 10,000 donors. We're going to build this North End Zone facility. We're going to do the Ox Gym. It's going to domino in the east side of the same. It's going to domino into extra mile. We're going to bring a uh, soccer, you know, closer, uh, you know, to our facility and, um, you know, and that's just the mentality. And, you know, and I think we've done enough. If you remember when I first got here, Bronco Nation, there were a lot of naysayers. It's like, oh yeah, you're not the first AD. You're not the first, you know, but what are you supposed to do? You know, I'm not going to let other people define our, our expectations. I'm going to define them. And that's part of my job. And I'm, we're going to go out and do it. And so you take your team and your staff and you take Bronco Nation you know, and, and you take your student athletes and, and, and your coaches and, you know, in three years, we've made huge, uh, you know, just leaps and bounds, like in terms of, of where we started versus where we are today. And, and that gives me so much hope in our future and what it looks like, because I still believe we've only scratched the surface. Oh, I 100% believe that. I Here's the deal, too, it being fully transparent with you. When you first came in, obviously, it was at a, a difficult time in all of college athletes, all of the world yeah. for that matter. But I, I was one of those. I, I used to be a season take a hold for like seven years and for football, that is. And then I was just thinking, I'm like, what is he going to be able to do? He's, I, I felt like they threw you to the wolves almost. And that's what my mentality was. But immediately, like it was like, Jeremiah, it was an immediate, like, shockwave that was felt. And then so as a business guy myself, I enjoy learning about businesses, entrepreneurship and all that. I was like, well, okay, he's got the attitude for it, but we don't have the money. And it's almost like you felt all those, like those comments coming from everybody. And you're like, I right, bet, like, let's see this. And yeah. you did it. Like, look at, and like you just mentioned, 3,500 to 7,000 donors. Like we didn't have the money, but guess what? It's still coming in. We need to improve, but it's still coming in. And you just answered one of my questions that I had, <clears throat> like it dominoes. I love that you, 
You mentioned like, that's how you're prioritizing things. You got to start here. We're going to fix this. That will, that will trickle into the East side of the stadium for, so to speak. Like you've already made massive improvements to like the football game day experience. That's a big thing from, yeah. you know, fans, like what's the game day experience like as compared to other places. And you've already improved there, but all these other things will trickle there. The extra mile arena will trickle. Soccer will trickle over. Like, It'll trickle, but you got to you got to get that momentum rolling, and that's what you've done. I think it's, uh, dude, it's awesome. And I just, I'm telling you, like, just watching you, I'm mesmerized at your leadership and the ability to execute. Some people talk a big game, some people execute. You do both, and I think it's amazing. Um, to two questions left uh, to respect your time here. One, in regards to the non-revenue generating sports, right? At Boise, uh, most colleges, it's usually just football that's generating the revenue for pretty much everything. Some of them, basketball will trickle into, um, but the majority of college athletics mainly is football, right? And so I don't think people realize the the financial component to that. Like, there's still scholarships that are given to other sports. How do they like? How do they pay for those? Like, you know, to to keep the lights on an extra mile, you got to keep the lights on for the women's and the men's basketball and anything else that's going on over there. Like it's the same thing. Um, I remember at t touring the stadium in, in Dallas for AT&T stadium. They mentioned the reason they were building a new facility for the high school football was because it cost them just as much for electricity to host a high school football game there as it does for a Dallas Cowboys game because they got to turn yeah. the lights on. And so like, there's little things like that. I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. That actually makes total sense. They're like, yeah, but we're not making any money off of like, any of the concessions or any of the ticket sales. So anyway, from the non-revenue generating sports, I want to learn from an athletic director, like anything that you can give as far as advice, like how do you even budget for those? Right. And you came in during the COVID era, like where, I mean, we had a, there's some people that were frustrated about baseball. There were some people frustrated about the wrestling component. I mean, there's mm -hmm. obviously the, the discussions that are out there, but like, how do we even budget for all of those? Cause they're not cheap to run those, but we still need those athletes to be here. You know, it's a big yeah. piece of our culture. So like, just qu uh, curious on that. Well, I, I think it goes back to, you know, what you said about football. Um, you know, you plan the work, work the plan, you know, everything we've done as a department, uh, you know, the fan base or Bronco nation may see it as one decision. I see it as 10, you know, I'm trying to get to an ultimate goal and to do it, you got to take one step. And so I look at last season, maybe one of the most frustrating for Bronco nation um, that obviously ended very differently than maybe how it started. I, I just, one of the crazier seasons I've ever been a part of. And you look at six games, people showed up, they showed up even when we weren't winning by whatever game or we weren't winning by enough. And, you know, they still showed up for games that traditionally maybe they wouldn't have. And, that's what dominoes into all of our other sport programs. And, you know, that was part of the plan. Six games, six sellouts is intentional. Yes, it does fund the football program, but it also funds everything else. But in the meantime, we have other things that play like soccer lights. Soccer lights wasn't just student athlete experience. That was a big part of it, but it was also fan experience. You look at soccer and its attendance and it skyrocketed last year. We sold out soccer matches to the point. Now we're looking at adding more bleachers. Now in the whole grand scheme of things, we're not selling tickets the same at the same level as we are at football, but every dollar matters. And so if you can maximize your football opportunity and, and at minimum invest into these other sport programs and create a better fan experience where you are selling more tickets. And, and we also have introduced season tickets for all sports that are fan facing. There was intentionality behind that. That becomes your pipeline. That's where we go back to in terms of our fundraising and our enhancement funds for soccer, for volleyball, for gymnastics. That's important. And so it's never just one decision. It's a combination of all of the above that ultimately leads to success. And I've taken approach an approach that we're not just a football program. Yes, that's that's where our brand has been and, and that's where we've had a tremendous amount of success and, and very grateful for that. But why can't we be a top soccer program? Why can't we be a top volleyball program or gymnastics or softball? And part of that is our investment into that experience. And so taking football and moving a, a very small video board in football to softball, where it creates a better experience, paid dividends for us. And then you add lights. 
and then you get to host the Mountain West Tournament. And now what's next is going to be a new field because the irrigation system is broken underneath and we just had the most precipitation in our history, I think, you know, over the last five months. You're always planning for what's next. You can't ever stop. And in, are you ever going to have enough? Can I, you know, our goal is to always be top three and we're grinding and, and striving for that in terms of salaries, in terms of budgets, you know, uh, and trying to create those experiences. But, you know, I believe it can be done. And that's a big part of the overall plan, you know, and, you know, why can't we monetize basketball differently? We're, we're, we hit all time highs in ticket sales in attendance you know, at some point I need to figure out because there's a lot of men's basketball games, you know, but I have the six game, six sellouts, you know, for football, you know, what's reality for us, you know, and, and the game times and the weeknights and, you know, basketball can be difficult, but going to three tournaments in a row, like everything counts, everything matters. Everything ties into the grand, you know, goal of funding this department because we are predominantly self-funded. And so we want to pay a coach more. I have to go find it. I say, I, we have to go find it. You know, if, if we want a, a, a new court, a new field, a new, you know, sound system, we have to go find it. There's not a money tree, you know? And so that becomes part of the vision and the planning. And, and that's what our team is consistently working on behind the scenes. And as soon as the season ends, we're already thinking about what's next. And really prior to the season ending, it's what's worked, what hasn't, not everything we do is going to work. And then we're going to take what works in other sports and see if it works in gymnastics. And we're going to try to continue to build that up. And the more money you can bring in, the more then you can invest back into your experiences. And, and that's for, for everyone involved. So there is no secret sauce to it. You know, uh, it, it, you, you know, if you want it to be a priority, you make it a priority. And, and we've done that and, you know, and, and we're not a finished product and, and we're not even close to being where we need to be but we have made a ton of progress and that's something that drives the staff and, and these external pods and, you know, for them to recognize, yeah, we didn't sell out every basketball game, but we sold out, you know, I think five, um, you know, that's huge for us. And we also averaged the most we've ever averaged. And we also had the most people come through those turnstiles ever, you know, and we also just went to our third tournament and now let's go to our fourth, you know, and that drives the coaches to do more and, and and, you know, so I, I think I have, you know, I constantly have thoughts of what's next and, you know, but that's something that I'm really proud of that, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to take this hand we've been dealt and, and whether appropriately or not, or if the, the expectations are unrealistic or not, we're going to take that hand and we're going to play it to the best of our ability. And, you know, you need people to embrace that and people have, and, and, you know, I think we've shown them what could be and, and that gives hope and hope is powerful and I can sell hope. And, you know, and that's something that I try to do on a daily basis. And that ties into the, the positive mentality of we can do it. And I know there's going to be disappointments along the way, but we're going to continue to chop wood and we're, we're not going to quit. And, you know, and, and ultimately I do believe we're going to find success in everything that we put our, you know, heart and soul into. No doubt about that. This is so cool. And just, I, I noted it down while you were talking. I have my phone out so I can take notes. One of the things you said is just kind of passed over irrigation systems broken under the field. People that's what I'm talking about. That's like Jeremiah Dickey and his whole staff have to deal with this type of stuff. That's the things the public doesn't realize like, little things like that. Well, now we got to figure out that situation. So we got probably got to figure out a field. Um, like that's, that's so Those are the things that, that honestly, you know, and it is, you know, cause it's not something that most people care about or, you know, it's, we're in the customer service business, right? So, you know, people show up and they want the best experience possible. And I hear about the East side of the stadium and, you know, for my first two years, every time it rained, our uh, track locker room flooded. And, wow. and we're trying to, you know, it's like, what's wrong with it? And finally we get someone in here and, and, you know, and they, you know, we're running out every ground ball and we realize the piping's broken, you know, like a hundred yards from where, you know, you could see it and it's underground and you got to go dig down and one, that stuff costs money Two, It does impact the experience of all it, it impacts my staff because I don't have a massive staff. And so, I mean, we had guys here at one, 2 AM in the morning on a Saturday night, just trying to, you know, pump water out. Yeah. 
so it does you don't have fungus and i mean those are the things that you know they maybe don't tell you that you have to worry about and maybe i didn't necessarily get to experience fully as as someone underneath an athletic director but you know yeah there's there are those things and you know and the list is endless and as soon as you get something new i mean a video board has an eight to ten year lifespan you know a field has 10 to 12 maybe you know a turf field has 10 to 12 maybe you know and so as soon as you get it you're kind of thinking about all right when i have to buy this again you know how are we going to do this and and it ties into upkeep and everything else but there's so much that goes in and i mentioned my staff earlier um they don't nearly they don't get the credit they deserve you know uh, um what we hear and and it infuriates me now i'm always kind you know but i get upset like we we know where the problems are and you know and it is counterproductive for me to be so vocal about them but when i get the emails late at night after a game or when i get the the social media posts and you know people are upset about x y and z um 99.9 percent .9 of the time we know because we're walking the facility we see it we know going into it and we're just trying to limit it and you know you just do the best you can and you try to keep everyone's head up in it and you know i tell them like you all go give me the muck and and that's really tied into my social media presence of how do we tell this story and and you know how how do i protect my team in, in many ways man i love it i love everything that you're saying it's so insightful um, the last question I have for you, Jeremiah, as a man of faith, uh, and I know you mentioned it, it is a big part of just who you are as a human being and it trickles into who you are as an athletic director as well. And the, the decisions you make, do you have a favorite scripture possibly that's an influential one that you'd be willing to share? Um, you know, I, right now, and it's funny, my wife and I just had this conversation and, you know, getting into the scripture more and, and, um, you know, I, I know that, you know, in general, I know that God brought me here for a reason. And, and I know that my steps are determined and, you know, and, and showing up in faith, you know, and understanding that, um, you know, his will is going to be done one way or another. And, you know, and trying to find peace in, in that process um, is, you know, it's, it's challenging many times. And, and there are many times that I question God of, of why, you know, um, but I also look at, at, you know, a lot of what my wife and, and we're in a Bible city group and what we read and, you know, uh, and it's, it's so obvious, but I don't know if there was one person in the Bible that had an easy path, not one, including Jesus Christ himself. And, you know, and, and it brings me peace, you know, uh, as we just went through Easter, you know, and, you know, uh, him dying for us, for us um, and have, have done nothing wrong, you know, and but then rising again. And, you know, uh, and, and that's something that that hits home for me right now. You know, uh, it's life is is challenging and, and it's you know, it's not always fun and and it throws a lot at you. But, you know, uh, he will come again. And and I know there's peace in that. And, you know, I know our our you know, our, our victory is not on this earth, you know, and, and that's something that, that, uh, it keeps me going because, you know, my job is just to do what he needs me to do and, and to be a presence for him and, and to be, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, this is my ministry, you know, and hopefully to live that out in action that others can see that, that, you know, his, his grace and, you know, it's, uh, it's something that they can feel and, and hopefully my actions, you know, show that. Appreciate that insight, man. And I, I'll tell you from my perspective, I don't work directly with you by any means, but I can tell that, right? Like I can tell it shines through you. And I think that's super cool. You said this is your ministry. I think it, it shows in the work that you do. You have a, a purpose, you know, your purpose. It's more of an eternal divine purpose, but you bring that here to the mortal existence. And I think it's amazing. Like you can see it go through and I just, yeah, I, I just commend you for that. And Jeremiah, I just want to say thank you. I want to respect your time. So I'll, I'll wrap up and just say thank you for joining the show, man. And uh, being willing to, you know, speak with me, to me or to you, I'm probably just a nobody, right? Like I, I'm a Boise State alum. Maybe you've seen me post a couple things here and there. You've heard the podcast, but like, I truly do appreciate you as a Boise State alum, just someone who's been around here my entire existence and just being able to like study you as a leader as well has been amazing. So it's an honor to be able to have you on my platform. 
and uh, yeah, and taking time out of your unbelievably busy schedule already to to share your insights is just beyond humbling for me. So thank you so much for doing that, and uh, I wish you all the best, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on, and and this is well worth it. And anything I can ever do for you, uh, let me know. And go Broncos. Go Broncos. I appreciate you, sir. Take care. Thanks, man. Guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of my show. Now, if you could go and do me a favor, head over to iTunes, give me five stars and leave me a review. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support.